Joseph Gordon-Levitt's awesome time travel flick Looper just came out and we are hooked on time travel. So we're gonna rant about time travel tropes we just wish would die. And then we're gonna talk to Caltech theoretical physicist Sean Carroll about the possibility of real life time travel. And finally, we check out your responses on the sci-fi hookups that shouldn't have happened. All this and more on this week's We Come From The Future. This episode of We Come From The Future is sponsored by Netflix. Welcome to We Come From The Future, the show where we travel back in time to kill the future, but only make it stronger. I'm Annalie Newitz. And I'm Esther Inglis Arkell. This week we are all about time travel. Now first up is the dumbest tropes in time travel fiction. Now what do you think? Well, the thing I hate most is when people travel back in time and either meet their parents, like in Back to the Future, their mentors, or they meet famous historical figures. I just, I cannot stand it. It's if you're gonna go back in time, you are not gonna meet people who are either important to you personally or important historically. It just seems completely unrealistic and silly. Okay, see, I'm, I'm kind of on the opposite of that. I think it can be cheesy, but that's kind of the point of time travel, is to go back and meet those neat people. One of my favorite stories is Bender's Big Score, the Futurama movie, and I think it's probably the best time travel story out there because the whole time travel paradox is figured out and it all fits in with the narrative. I'm like, that is so clever. See, I think, you know, one of the films that I really like in the time travel genre is Primer, mm -hmm. um, which is a cult indie film where the characters invent a time machine which has very limited range. It's supposed to be very realistic mm -hmm. and so they can, they can only go back a limited time so the more they go back in time, the more they, it becomes chaotic and they can't figure out the structure of what they've created in the timeline. So I really think that time travel just has to be messy. Like it can't all fit together neatly like a puzzle, except maybe in a comedy like Futurama. I just, I like a dark, dark, chaotic, fucked up time travel story like that. Okay, well, if you like dark, it's a little cheesy too, but I like The Time Traveler's Wife because even with this um, this idea of like, I have no idea where I'm going, I don't know how long I'll stay there, I have no control over anything, also I'm naked, um, <laughs> idea, like this whole movie, that's the whole premise, it still all fits together. Yeah, no, I'm still, I'm on the side of like time bandits or something, you know, mm -hmm. I want it to be just like, guys going through holes in reality, stealing shit, occasionally maybe meeting some famous person, but mostly just like hanging out with like the dregs of society and, <laughs> and kind of, you know, you know, Satan okay. wins and things like that. Oh, so that's a great way to solve time travel. <laughs> You're gonna hang out with the dregs of society and Satan will win. Well, okay, so this is one of the big problems, right, is that these movies are so scientifically impoverished, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's just, they, you have to have Satan to make them work out. <laughs> and so I think really what we need to know now is how would time travel actually work from a scientific perspective? So we brought in a Caltech theoretical physicist, Sean Carroll, to answer that question. So joining us to answer our questions about what kind of time travel movies are realistic is theoretical physicist from Caltech, Sean Carroll. Thank you so much for being here, Sean. Thanks for having me. Um, so tell us, how would time travel actually work if it could happen in real life? Is, it, is there a possibility that it could happen at all? There's a possibility. No, the answer is probably no, it doesn't happen. But it is possible basically because Einstein realized that space and time are curved. So the short version is that you curve space and time so much that time itself loops back. And you, you think you're going into the future the whole time, but space time is actually sending you into the past through a wormhole or a cosmic string or something crazy like that. So we could go into the past, but we probably couldn't go into the future using that model. The future is easy. I went into the future yesterday, and here I am right now. <laughs> it's just uh, how fast you go into the future, and even that's actually also easy. You can go into the future as fast as you want. All of the difficulty in time travel is coming back to the past. Hmm. So what annoys you the most about seeing images of time travel in science fiction movies? I mean, what, what's the one kind of trope or recurring theme that just drives you nuts as a physicist? It's actually the idea that there is 
time as experienced by the characters. And then there's like extra metaphysical movie narrative time that also exists. And it's a complete fiction of uh, the science fiction industry. So when you see something happen caused by a character in the past, and then suddenly the future changes, as in Back to the Future, for example. And so what in the world does that mean suddenly? Something happens in the 1950s and then right away something happens in the 1980s. It's 30 years later. There's no such thing as right away. So they're not even really trying to make sense uh, in movies where you see a character in one time period do something and then the effect is felt right away in some completely other time period. If something happened in the past, like how would you want it to be depicted so that it would be a little bit more correct? Well, there's two choices, two ways you can do it. One way is you just can't change the present. You can travel back to the past, but you were always there and you were always doing these things and you just didn't know about it. So you can learn more about the past, but you can't actually change anything. And the other possibility is an alternative timeline. You can bring into existence a whole new reality by messing around with the past. And then if you want to know what's going to happen 30 years in the future, you wait 30 years, just like we always do. By traveling into the future in constant time. <laughs> One second per second. That's the usual rate at which things move, yes. Uh -huh. So are there any movies or stories that you think actually get time travel right, or at least approaching correct? Yeah, no, there are. Um, at the sort of heavy level, there are movies like 12 Monkeys, where there's a set of trips back into the past, but at the end you realize they're all consistent with each other and there was no changing the past, there was no alternative. It all fits together very, very nicely. Um, and there's more fun movies like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, where they don't try too hard to make it realistic in any sense, but they actually do use examples of how time travel would actually work. There's a scene I just have to describe where, you know, they need a key to open the jail, but they don't have enough time to get it. And they realize, but we have a time machine. We have enough, as much time as we could possibly want. So in the future, we'll go to the past, get the key, and then we'll leave it for ourselves here behind that sign. And then they look behind the sign, and there it is. <laughs> That's actually how time travel would work. And it's done better in this goofy comedy than in all sorts of slightly more ambitious movies. Thanks so much for being here, Sean. If you want to hear more of Sean Carroll's thoughts about time, be sure to pick up his book, From Eternity to Here, and you can read his blog, Cosmic Variants, on the Discover website. And now, a word from our sponsor. One of the best ways to simulate the thrills of a time machine is with Netflix. From great sci-fi shows and their wild predictions of what the future will look like, to documentaries focusing on the lives of ancient civilizations or prehistoric reptiles, you can find a wide range of TV shows and movies to satisfy any viewer. Netflix streams TV shows and movies directly to your home, saving you time, money, and hassle. When you sign up as a Netflix Unlimited member, you can instantly watch TV episodes and movies streaming directly to your web browser or right on your TV with an Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii, Apple device, Nook, or Kindle. You can watch as many movies as you want, anytime you want, and cancel anytime. Go to netflix.com future and sign up now. Be sure to use that URL so they know that we sent you. Last week we talked about sci-fi romance with the members of Vaginal Fantasy Book Club, but we left something out and viewer Miraz had to write in. She said, hey folks, I always look forward to We Come From The Future and enjoy today's episode, thank you. But no one even hinted at any non-straight couple romances. How about H.G. Wells and Micah in Warehouse 13? On Voyager, Catherine Janeway and Seven clearly had something intense lurking in the background. And Xenia, uh, Zena and Gabrielle, enough said. Cheers, Miraz. First of all, I would say that the tension between um, Micah and H.G. Wells on Warehouse 13 is totally there. The actors have said that they deliberately put that in. Um, and so to the list of kind of homo subtext, I would also add Kaylee's crush on Inara in Firefly. Totally valid. Obviously Kirk and Spock, the original, like that's the OG homo subtext of all <laughs> science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, then there's Jocelyn Carey's uh, great book, Santa Olivia. Jocelyn Carey wrote the Kushil series that's been featured on Vaginal Fantasies. Santa Olivia is about a lesbian boxer with Wolverine-like superpowers. It is so awesome. Um, and then of course, you know, for overt homotastic action. There's Willow and Tara and Buffy. Mm -hmm. And then even Buffy got to have a brief lesbian romance in the comic books, which you can complain about, but I still thought it was kind of awesome. Okay, talking about comic books, what gets me is 
I had, Bonnie and I were having this argument about whether superheroes should date each other last week, and mm -hmm. I had the perfect couple, and I let him get away, and that was Apollo and the Midnighter, who were two gay guys in the authority, long-standing relationship, totally kick-ass, and they, they never had any of the drama that you get from, like, Bruce Wayne in one of his dates. Mm -hmm. Or Kirk and Spock. Let's talk yeah. about drama. Holy crap. So I had, I could have crushed her. <laughs> <laughs> and I let it get away, and I leave. <laughs> That's what happens when I leave, you know, yeah. just things go to shit. I go off my game. <laughs> so there's a lot more romance to be mined, and that'll be someday. But in the meantime, I urge you, if you want to find some good homotastic sci-fi, to look for all the fan vids of gay sex from Mass Effect on YouTube. Uh, and also, send us your emails. <laughs> Please send us your questions and comments. Send us fan vids, email us at we come from the future at revision3.com. Don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for io9. And you can subscribe to us on YouTube by clicking right there. That's it for this episode. Join us next week after we've all traveled into the future. <laughs>